oftentimes women are not diagnosed as a narcissist so they're going to be typically diagnosed as borderline personality disorder histrionic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder all that to say is that the diagnosis of narcissism is highly gendered apparently there's a lot of debate in the world of psychology if NPD is even a personality disorder or if it's a culture bound syndrome, meaning it's only applicable in certain cultures, which I find very interesting simply because what is true as a narcissist in America is not necessarily true as a narcissist in let's say Japan, because the archetypes of the two people are very, very different. So let's talk about the stereotype of the male narcissist and a female narcissist. This content is for information or educational purposes only do not substitute for professional medical advice or consultations with healthcare professionals. Let's quickly define what a narcissist is. This is from the American Psychiatric Association. I visually placed it here in case you want to read it, but it can be summarized as a preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. A belief that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions a need for excessive admiration, a sense of entitlement. <laughs> The male narcissist is the James Bond of the world. He tends to be successful, wealthy, powerful. He is the alpha, top of the dominance hierarchy. He also tends to be cold and distant. So he's labeled as the asshole. And on the female side, I want you to think the Marilyn Monroe or perhaps the Megan Fox of the world. And so she tends to be very hypersexualized. Everybody wants her sexually. She also tends to be highly emotionally labile. She has infantile qualities. So she's either childlike or has that innocence to her. She's fragile. She's self-destructive. But again, all of that doesn't matter because she's crazy hot. That term of the crazy hot girl really exemplifies the female archetype of a narcissist. And in the American culture, we tend to label those two types as feminine and masculine. It's almost toxic femininity and toxic masculinity. And I noticed a few things in the Georgia and Jenny that were key points of what a female narcissist might exemplify. But by the way, not only what a female narcissist might exemplify, but it's also what somebody with PTSD or complex PTSD might exemplify. Georgia and Jenny are the main characters of this show. So Georgia is the mother, Jenny is the daughter, and Georgia is only 30 years old and she has a teenage daughter. How is that possible? Later on in the show, it was revealed that she was sexually abused by her stepdad multiple times and eventually she ran away from home, became homeless, and then she got pregnant. Now, it's very common that people with PTSD or complex PTSD has a history of sexual childhood trauma. PTSD, as you know, something traumatizing happened and then it's gonna affect you later on in the future. You tend to have these flashbacks. You tend to have uh, defense mechanisms. You tend to not be able to deal with life in a normal way because of something traumatizing that happened to you. But it's also also very common that people with narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and other personality disorders also has sexual childhood trauma. Which by the way, childhood sexual trauma could be anything from actual physical sexual trauma or it could be any boundary that is crossed. Whether let's say you felt uncomfortable or comments were made about you multiple times just as a child that was sexually based or abusive. And so basically it's on a scale. That being said, Georgia was abused by her stepfather multiple times. And you can see in the scene when she's talking to her sister that after she left, apparently that same stepfather started to abuse her little sister that it's still emotionally affecting her. This is clearly a sign that Georgia has empathy. Even when she broke down and told her daughter that she was abused by her stepfather, it seemed like a genuine emotional reaction. I was abused by my stepdad my whole childhood. He molested me most nights with my mom asleep in the next room. That's why I ran away when I was 14. I've been homeless. I've been in jail. 
It seems like she has this survival instinct that she just needs to keep moving forward, keep going. So another interesting thing happens is that Georgia's ex, which is Jenny's father, comes into town. He comes back and apparently they have this push-pull relationship in which you come together and that intimacy, that vulnerability makes them so scared, so fearful that she'll push the other person away and as soon as the person is pushed away she's going to want to pull them back in okay sorry i forgot the pattern this is the part where you ignore my calls and stop talking to me for the next eight months this also goes into codependency and codependent relationships but it seems that it's more so on georgia's side than it is her partner and you can see georgia's defense mechanism which uh the actress did beautifully which is I'm just completely shutting down because I can't be vulnerable because what does vulnerability mean? Vulnerability means that I'm going to get hurt and I don't want to get hurt. So I need to shut down my emotions completely. And so that's exactly what she does here. It's very common, especially when things become intimate, especially in a romantic partner because vulnerability equals fear. Vulnerability equals death. It equals pain. She's also dating this other man who's a politician and he seems like a sweet enough guy but she was gonna break up with him because she slept with her ex. When she goes and says I'm basically breaking up with you this is how this guy responds. In this scene he was practically pitching Georgia to not only stay with him but be a power couple. He even mentions that power is what we need, it's what we eat, together we can accomplish more. And then he literally proposes to her with a ring. I wanna remind you of the male archetype of a narcissist and a female archetype of a narcissist. Because this guy, in just that one scene, exemplified the wealth, the power, the alpha. Not only that, it's saying, hey, I see you and I know what you want. I know you want power. So a female narcissist wants power. She tends to gain power by her sexual paralysis, which you can see that Georgia does. So she spends a lot of time in her looks. She even tells her own daughter that you should, in a way, weaponize your sexuality. That's how you get things from not only men, but from life in general. So she has this idea in her head that sex is power for a female. And for men, it tends to be money, right? So money for men, sex for women. And if these two people come together, it's very often that like trauma attracts like trauma. So if you have uh, physical abuse as a child, you might naturally be attracted to people who also had physical abuse as a child. And you might assume that everybody had physical abuse as a child, but actually you just tend to attract those people because the same defense mechanisms that they have, you understand it because you have those same defense mechanisms. So it's as if like baggage attracts like baggage. So it doesn't mean that these are two narcissists coming together because it almost seems like they genuinely love each other. But also the fact that this man knew that she slept with her ex completely dismisses it and goes, look, you are my partner. I can see that you are my equal and I see what you want. I see you want power. I recognize that and I'm proposing that we become a team. She feels like not only are her dark traits seen, but it's actually celebrated. And so she ends up going back to her ex saying, look, so she ends up going back to her ex and the ex actually said, look, I saw the way you look at each other and this is what you want. And I'm not gonna hold you back from what you want. And even though she's emotionally pulled towards this man who is not high on the dominance hierarchy, he's this artistic man, he doesn't exemplify the wealth, the power, the alpha that she needs almost in order to validate herself as a trauma response let's be clear this is a trauma response because in that archetype 
a woman feels more safe. This goes back to the evolution psychology of, of course, you want a man with the most resources as a woman because that means your child is more likely to survive. And as a mother, you want your child to have the best chance of survival. The best chance of survival is having a mate who has the most resources so you won't run out of food or shelter. So it's something that's completely ingrained in us. But it's ingrained in people even more when they had boundaries crossed in childhood. On a scale of boundaries being extremely crossed consistently all the time and not so much anymore, people who had a lot of boundaries cross when they were in childhood tends to be more anxious. They tend to look for stability more than the person who always had stability because they assume it'll always be there. And in this example, her ex, who is the artist who travels the world, he actually came from a family that's very wealthy, very stable. And so I, I applaud the writers because it completely fits the archetype of Look, this guy, this artist, is not afraid to travel the world, be an artist, and be the broke artist, so to speak, not go to college, because he was raised in a household that was very stable, very loving, very supportive. So he's not afraid to do all of these other things, as opposed to if your childhood was very unstable, you had a lot of abuse, you had a lot of boundaries being crossed, you are so used to that, you're so in the survival fight or flight mode that you're constantly just trying to grab onto any type of stability. And if that stability means going to drugs and having the drugs, the addiction to drugs being that stable source, or oftentimes people who are addicts go into religion and have religion their stable source. They're just really trying to grasp onto something. And for some people, it's finding a partner who's that stable source. I think what Georgia really sees in this man is the stable source of, hey, if this man is the archetype of the powerful, wealthy alpha in the world, I, as a woman, will be safe. I will be secure. My children will have the best chance in the world to be able to be out there. Even at one point in the show, she says that I, I want the best for my children. I want them to be able to not experience what I did as a child. So everything that she does, it's the mother's instincts to make sure that her children has the best chance at life, especially because she didn't have the best childhood. She wants to make sure in whatever it takes, whatever it costs to give them the best possible chance at life. So going into it, it doesn't seem like it's narcissism because narcissism has a little tail end of entitlement and malicious exploitation. It seems like it's not an entitlement. It seems like it's survival. Her motivation behind everything that she does seems like it's a trauma response, meaning it's a severe complex PTSD and she's just responding to it and she's never dealt with it, which also makes sense because she had a child when she was 15. She had a child when she was still a child. There's not really that much time for her to develop her psychology, her emotions, she really just probably didn't. I saw this quote on Brene Brown that I thought was extremely relevant to this. She's famous for her TED talk and science and research behind vulnerability. And she said this exact quote, 95% of what I see that people call pathology is its armor, its behaviors and way of thinking to protect myself. I understand why there's a whole debate on whether these personality disorders even exist or if it's just simply the defense mechanisms that happen in early childhood trauma, whether it's sexual, physical, mental, emotional, or otherwise, it's the defense mechanisms that we developed and all of us have developed some sort of defense mechanisms to deal with what was happening at the time. When you're a child, you're just more vulnerable to these traumatic events affecting you because your brain is still developing. Also at the fact that the younger you are, it's harder for you to understand why things are happening and you tend to blame yourself. Something must be wrong with me or the world is a scary place. And think, is there something in the past or do I idealize the uh, 
trope of men and what a male narcissist looks like do i idealize that stereotype and women too do i idealize that stereotype of women narcissists because we celebrate the kim kardashians in the world right we celebrate the super entrepreneur in this world we celebrate those extreme archetypes and want to emulate that both the positive and the toxic negative side of each stereotype and questioning why that is do we actually want to be that archetype or is there something going on with ourselves that we just simply need to heal yeah that's it <laughs> Here on this channel, we typically talk about communication, relationships, and how to speak to people with confidence. So if that's something you're interested in, check out my video on verbal fluency. I'll link that below for you because if you do have a low verbal fluency score, it could also mean that you have some sort of trauma response. Some trauma responses have acute aneurysms, so you tend to forget certain things or your memory isn't as good. And so that can be a symptom of possible trauma if this is something that is consistent with you and verbal fluency is one test the fas test is one test you can do to determine if you possibly have something going on with you internally psychologically within your brain please hit that like button if you like today's analysis and comment below an emoji that expresses how you feel about this video and i will see you on the next video